Okay. Yes. So we're back with another Pickle Dragon Unscripted. And this time we are going to ask a very important question. And that is, who wouldn't want to run a game store, right? <laughs> I think, and I think everybody, everybody who, who plays games um, of some kind is fanatized at one time about, oh, it'd be so awesome to have my own game store. And in fact, years ago, and it was around the time where my wife and I had finally said, you know, we should move to the New Orleans area. And this was like 13 years ago. And, and she's like, you could open and run a game store, Matt. I'm like thinking to myself, it sounds really good, but I bet there's a catch. And so we're going to talk about that. Um, so I'm going to have each of you guys introduce yourselves, your store, um, and then we'll just jump right in uh, with, with a very important question, which we'll get to. Um, so why don't we start with Nick, who's over here. Sure. Uh, I'm Nick Jones. I'm a vice president of Titan Games, and we have stores in Springfield and Champaign, Illinois. Right on. And Mac and Chris down below. At least for me, you're down below. You're down well, there. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, we are Go For Games. Uh, my name is Mac Nierendorn, and this is... For me? Yeah. And I'm Chris. Uh, I'm the manager of Go For Games. And I'm the head janitor. I, I clean the toilets around here very well. Not so well. Please no. be warned. <laughs> uh, but yeah, we've uh, we've been in business. We only have one store, uh, but we've been in business for about eleven years now, and uh, we're just trucking along, trying to keep the dream alive. Living the dream. All right. John has a different story for us. John is the former owner of Battleground Games and Hobbies, which. We had for, I think, seven years before we closed, you know, and I don't know. I was everything for it, I guess, you know, uh, owner, janitor like Mac, uh, <laughs> shoulder for people to cry on, you know, uh, somebody has to keep the bathrooms clean. Yep. Yeah. Somebody has to remind people to shower and all that kind of stuff. Ooh, that's, that's a big one. That's a, <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's a struggle, but <laughs> sometimes. Yeah, I think that that was uh, uh, probably worse in years past, at least from my experience, with the yeah, exception that there was there used to be a game store where, where Nick is um, called Capital City Games, and they were completely uh, war gaming, like Warhammer and that sort of thing. And you would walk in there and you would want to like just turn around and leave some days because it was the, the smell from the front room was, was unbelievable. So, and I don't know if that's just a different kind of gamer or if it's just because they're all standing there hovering around sweating because, you know, their their, their uh, opponent just made a horrible, horrible uh, move against them. So, but in any case, so the real important question I wanted to ask you guys to start with, we're just going to fire right in. Um, and we'll start with Mac and Chris is why or how did you come to the decision that you want to open go for games and take the plunge into the deep end? Uh, wow. So um, my journey uh, was a, a little a little awkward. I, uh, I really hated the job that I was currently doing. <laughs> I was, uh, I was uh, managing two restaurants in the greater New Orleans area. And um, I just 18 hour days and uh, living, eating, sometimes sleeping at the restaurants. Um, it just, it really sucked. And uh, I had a, a very good buddy of mine from my childhood uh, come back and he's like, hey, you know, uh, all the game shops in Katrina, uh, since Katrina, Hurricane Katrina hit New Orleans, have closed. Uh, but we had this one guy who is kind of selling game stuff out of another store, kind of out of the back of his other store. You should definitely come check this out. I was like, ah, I, I don't know about that. Um, and he's like, no, 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 just it's for, for old time's sake, come check it out. So I, I took a lunch break and I went to his shop and he owned a paintball store. And uh, in the back of his paintball store, he was selling D&D books and some miniatures and some paints and things like that. Uh, we uh, got to talking and uh, I decided... Um, to invest in his, his side business 
and it did very, very well. Uh, then uh, about a year later, he, um, he told me that he could no longer maintain his business and he would have to close. And I was like, well, what about the game side? And he's like, it's doing really well. Um, I wish we could keep, I could keep that going, but you know, I just, I don't have the capital to be able to do so. Well, because I didn't do anything other than eat, sleep and, and pretty much live my life at the two restaurants, I, I had accumulated a, a, a sizable little nest egg. So um, I asked if I could look at his books, I was, saw his books, they were very good. The, the numbers had a lot of growth. So I said, you know what, goodbye restaurants, this is what I'm gonna do. And um, uh, 10 years later, I met Chris and Chris has almost single-handedly revolutionized our business. Um, we moved from a, a 14, 40 square foot location to a 3,700 something Don't location. Don't look at me like I it, know. And uh, we have 24 hour, a 24 hour <laughs> gaming uh, playroom uh, that has remote access for all of our paid members. Um, and uh, we have a very robust e-commerce um, site now uh, for what we do um, and shipping pretty much everywhere. Um, we shipped to England last year. Uh, we shipped a bunch of the, the giant uh, Arbiturus uh, white gargantuan dragons. Um, so yeah, we've just been rocking and rolling and uh yeah chris really made that uh a reality so i'm very uh Aww. very happy so where where did you get your well why don't we give the others a chance to answer and then we'll come back to chris because i'm really interested in in picking her brain a little bit but <laughs> uh so nick how did you decide to and i kind i know a bit about what you did before yeah um, but uh why don't you go jump into that sure so i had a pretty reasonably long, I guess, career in sales, be it technology or real estate. Uh, kind of bouncing back and forth between a couple jobs, and I was just never really happy with what I was doing. Uh, so when a good friend of mine from childhood and his high school buddy or his college buddy who DM'd with him opened up a store in my hometown, I immediately started going there to play different games and get involved with stuff. And after six months or so, uh, they decided that they were ready to expand and asked me if I wanted to join as an owner and uh, open up another store. So I did because I was not happy with working in sales. <laughs> uh, so I made a little leap of faith and moved about an hour away to another town where we had a, a good friend of mine lived and uh, we opened up another store in Springfield. So, so you have, and we didn't really jump into that. I know I know Mac, you you and I have talked about your gaming pack, pack, past, but uh, obviously Nick is. Were you were you a Magic player before Nick? No, not at all. I learned to play Magic because I was getting involved with the store, and it was I was one of those weird people where like I played all of the games but Magic, and it was like Magic for me at that time was just a little too nerdy for me. So, oh, wow. <laughs> but then once I started playing, I'm like, okay, I completely get why people love this game. Like, there's so mm -hmm. many different cool aspects to it. I was just pushing it away, saying I'm not that kind of nerd until that happened. <laughs> a gatekeeper, <laughs> yeah, gatekeeper. <laughs> yeah. yeah, until you, uh, until you, someone made that pontoon bridge for you. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. Now I'm the guy who has more investments than I care to discuss, and all of the commander decks that'll fit in a drawer at the store and <laughs> everything else. So it's, uh, yeah. yeah. I actually got back in playing Catan of all things and uh, the X-Wings miniature game. So oh, right on. So John, you're, you have a different story because you have, you are a past owner, but you have, you, I think took on, um, took on a challenge unlike these other two who they they're in larger cities so why don't you jump in there real quick well i mean the the easiest thing was i i actually own a restaurant mac so oh, do you really i, I, I um, empathize oh. with your world but it, oof. <laughs> but here's the thing right it's a completely seasonal restaurant that's only open for four months out of the year it's only open in the summer so oh. what i kept finding myself was i was 
like had seven months out of the year, which you would think having seven months make enough money in the summer that I don't need to do anything else the rest of the year. Mm-hmm. But that you would think that'd be ideal, but I think I'm just too, I don't know, my brain just doesn't shut off and I just keep going and going. So I kept coming up with things to do in the winter, you know, and um, I had a, a business where I restored arcades and pinballs. So I did that for years and I met a guy, I went to high school with this guy. I met him through the restaurant. We became inseparable best buddies. He was a magic player and he played D&D also, but like a third edition nerd guy. So I, I go back to 79. I'm older than probably all of you, I think. I just turned 52. So, but Philip convinced me that uh, like, you know, we should open up a spot where you put your arcades and we could sell, you know, magic and we can, you know, and the, the goal was for us to have a place to be creative and create games together and things like that, because we had been working on all these ideas for games. You know, we make an office over at Panera Bread and use their Wi-Fi and, you know, work on these games that we're going to publish together. And what happened is, is that we, we opened up a spot, a little, little small spot that had a large garage attached to it, which became where I was repairing arcades and stuff. And then, you know, I didn't, I also didn't play magic. Like with a not quite Nick's story on it, I didn't think that it was too nerdy. What happened was, is that I recall when magic hit, when it first came out, I just remember a lot of people had moved away from Dungeons and Dragons and were like, that was somehow a substitute because, and at the time I didn't understand it, but I get it now that it's much easier to get one other person together to play some quick pickup games of magic than it was to get your group together on a Tuesday, right. especially in the nineties, you know, where everybody was just starting to get families. Everybody my age was starting to get families and things like that. And so Anyway, I just didn't play magic. <laughs> when we opened the store, I said, look, Philip, you're going to have to handle the magic. I don't know the first damn thing about the game. But we would alternate who would who would sit at the shop. And we're in a very small town. So, you know, the first couple weeks of that, there was like two kids coming in regular. And one of them was this kid, Randy. And he was like, do you want to play magic? And I'm like, I don't know. I don't know how to play it. Do you want to play Munchkin? Do you want to play, you know, what? I, I was trying to get him to play anything else because I didn't know how to play magic and I wasn't invested in it. And I, it was about like two weeks in, I was like, all right, I guess I'm going to have to learn this game, you know? So I sat down and, and like all of you, I have a pile of commander decks, even though I don't have a store, I haven't played a game of commander in two, since before the pandemic. But, you know, I've got like cards sitting on my desk, you know, <laughs> like the, the collection of like, oh, this card's yeah. still still valuable <laughs> cards or whatever. So yeah, it, it's a little bit, it's different because we're from a smaller community. And really what happened is, is that um, even before the pandemic, it collapsed in on itself. We started off Mac, it sounded like you guys have like a membership kind of thing going mm-hmm. on where, and we started like that. And okay. And so, because that was my thing at the time, like I said, well, look, if we're going to do this, neither one of us can afford to really just sit here hours and hours and hours in a tiny little town, not ever possibly being able to make anything off of retail sales. You know, the the retail thing was just going to be out the door no matter what. So we had like a membership kind of thing. And it was fairly successful as, as that. I, it, and by successful, I mean it was paying for another guy to sit there and, you know, it was starting to grow. And I let them convince me to just give straight retail a try. And it was a mistake. Like, I should have never done that. Uh, but actually, I'm glad I did. As I, you know, we kind of went over this, but it, it, I wouldn't be doing, I wouldn't be manufacturing miniatures had I not had the game store. Because watching them play with miniatures made me get my old miniatures out, which made me want to play Warhammer with them, which I didn't know how to play, which then made me go, well, I don't have enough miniatures, um, and I don't really want to buy these miniatures, so how do they make miniatures? And then it just all spiraled into what I'm doing now, which is way more lucrative. <laughs> As I said, I make tens, tens of dollars more. <laughs> I, actually, I do all right with it. 
So what were you guys, like, and anyone just jump in, what were your expectations? Like when you first decided, hey, I'm going to do this thing, um, take the plunge, what were your expectations? And um, I'm pretty sure most of you guys are, obviously John's in a completely different space now, but um, but uh, I think all of you guys have evolved immensely since you first took the plunge. Uh, honestly, I, I think uh, with, with with retail, uh, I, I had experience before the restaurants. I, I, I ran um, a, comp a very popular comic book shop in this area. Um, and uh, I was with Mr. Carl for, oh God, I think maybe seven or eight years. And uh, I learned everything that I, I, I possibly could about retail, good retail from him. Uh, he was a fantastic paraplegic owner and he was just the, the grandfather for the entire neighborhood of children. Um, he was just a great man. Uh, but as far as like uh, how, I guess your question is like how things have changed. Um, I do have to say with, with retail, when you, when you treat it as a business, you begin to see things as units and how many turns and how much does a, pr a product depreciate in value when it's sitting on a shelf for X amount of time, you know, uh, you're starting to look at, you know, uh, what is the, what are the, the cogs for, for this month, you know, uh, versus doing it this way or things like that. And I think I have, I don't see it so much as games anymore as I see it as units to move and sell. Um, I'm interested to actually kind of find out how you feel about it because this is your first retail outing, right, Chris? I mean, I've worked in retail before. I just promised myself I would never do oh. it. <laughs> <laughs> How's that working out for you? Uh, yeah. <laughs> well, so came up with the with the whole the, the whole system he has now, right? So where where was your inspiration there? And and was it was I mean, how long have you been a manager there? Almost. Oh, it's a little over a year. Yeah. So you kind of did you come in? Obviously, when he was when Mac was still in the the old store, right? And I did. I rolled in around like the middle of the pandemic. Um, I was a um, bar manager before, also working in the service industry, and. Um, you know, the pandemic hit and I had all these, this time and like, I just became so much happier. And I was like, wow, you know, I'd really like to not go back to that. I don't care if I don't make any money. <laughs> Let me give this a try. Welcome to America now, right? <laughs> yeah, I, and so I kind of just fell in here and I, you know, I fell in love with the entire community and um, everything that Mac has made here. So I just kind of like, burrowed my way in and made this my home as well so that's how I wound up here and what what was your inspiration for everything that all the changes that you implemented um well I guess the inspiration was really just to have the place do better and grow and be able to be part of that growth and see everything like continue to flourish um you know the way Mac has made it uh, do in the past. And I just, I really wanted to just help with that. I think uh, also, if you don't mind, uh, Chris, I think some of the things that she had brought on, um, I think John can really appreciate this too. She brought on a lot of service industry techniques <laughs> to make sure that things ran smooth. Yeah. Uh, you know, we would definitely uh, evaluate costs, shrinkage and things like that in a way that you would evaluate spillage or food Same loss concepts, like right? she brought a lot of that to the table yeah uh, in which i did not um so that that was that was really good and she's really she's really whipped everybody into shape so that's been very efficient <laughs> <laughs> yeah. so did she come to you like one day and he's and say mac i got an idea for you to spend a lot of money at first uh, no, no. no, yeah, no. I pyramid schemed him. It's, oh. like here. it's still going strong, but it's working for both of us. Wait, what? <laughs> Don't worry about it. Don't worry Don't about worry it. About it. Um, but no, she she she's been really a fantastic partner in everything. Uh, 
she definitely uh, keeps the store grounded when I get like weird um, manic energy for like an idea or something. She's like, okay, hold on. Let's, let's see how we can shape this chaos into something that actually works. So she's very good about that. So Nick, I, now, oh, go ahead, Chris. Oh, uh, well, I was gonna say, I don't know. I don't know if maybe it helps too, is I just kind of have like a newer perspective to a lot of this. I'm a, um, in reform, not really in reform. I was more of like a video gamer my whole life. Um, not so much tabletop stuff. I played D and D and magic, but not so much. Uh, you know, I didn't know there was 100 million board games in the whole world that you could play, and they were all crazy. Um, so, have you been converted to those million? Oh yeah, games? absolutely. Little by little. Right on. Win by win. <laughs> I'm right. slowly being converted. All right. So, and I, Nick, you know, when I spent a lot of time in your store. Yes, you did. Um, and I have to, I have to say, like, from the first day I went in to go to, go for game, to Titan Games, um, the store evolved immensely to what oh, it yeah. was just before the pandemic, because pandemic turned it into something different for the time being right but and we'll talk about we might talk about that but up to that point um it was it was um i think i think the the rpgers created a, a challenge for you and yeah um but that evolution i think you were like 100 percent into the in well i should say 95 percent into the magic and like 5% into board games. And then I walked in the store and was like, hey, we should play D&D here. And, um, and it kind of like exploded from there. But I, I don't know what, what, I know that there came a point in time, Wednesday night had been your big uh, magic night. And then we started playing D&D, like one or two tables. And then uh, it was pretty soon there were no tables left for, for uh, magic anymore. But yeah. Uh, I'll let you. I'll let you talk about that. Because well, I yeah. mean, I think we all, as businesses, have to evolve as we see trends and things change, whether it's in our customers or in the industry itself. And that was something that we were really in tune with uh, from the time I started getting involved with the company. Um, so I joined Titan Games after it had already been open for two years, um, and in those two years, they had essentially turned a profit and had never had a loan from a bank. So. It was really impressive to walk in and see those books and know that we were working with people that knew what they were doing on the business side of things and also presenting a store that was very friendly to new gamers of all kinds. And it, the goal with all of our stores has always been we want our store to be somewhere that our mom is comfortable walking into versus I know we've all been around the industry long enough that there were places that you went into as a gamer and kind of went, I don't know if I'm real comfortable being in here with that cat in the corner that's staring me down and <laughs> weird smells and all kinds of stuff, you know, kind of the old guard of what was a game store in like the 90s kind of thing. So, um, yeah, coming from that and knowing that at the time was revolutionary in the town we were in. And then kind of bringing it into another town that didn't have a lot of competition at the time or a lot of good competition at the time. Uh, ruffled some feathers, but people got on board really quickly as soon as they saw the overall quality of what we were presenting to that community as well. And that's where we started out very heavy in magic just because that was the history of the store in the previous town was very heavy magic. Um, but within a year and a half, we doubled our D, D section added minis started adding some paints in and that was just because the people that were coming into the store were requesting those products so we had to fulfill that need um matt you would probably be really surprised now we actually only have six tables set up at this time and they are all the smaller version of the table oh so like the entire front half of our store is converted to full-on retail at this point wow so that is, that is a big change. It used to yeah. be all tables. Well, you know, we had two years there that I couldn't use tables. So <laughs> got to use them for something. Yeah. We started filling them with product and started selling. So we started looking at the numbers, the turns, and how much product we were actually able to roll through. And 
it just made financial sense to make that adjustment. So, you know, I, I, when you mentioned the game stores from the nineties, I had swore off game stores for a number of years back in, back in the, the early nineties, it was metropolis city and you could not flag down a cashier for anything because they're off playing games and stuff. Um, but, uh, I mean, that is kind of like the old stereotype of, Oh, I gotta go help somebody, you know, but, uh, I think it's interesting, Mac, you were mentioning Hurricane Katrina. Um, Nick, you kind of showed up. What year did, did Titan open? Seven years ago now, I believe. So, Because there were a, a number of game stores in the area until a tornado whipped through Springfield and just leveled the town. And I remember John's store, which changed names over and over again. I don't know what it's called right now, but, you know, it was completely gone. Like the whole store, like there was a toilet left. And that was it. You know? oh, oh, no. And that was the toilet he hung on to during the <laughs> Literally. That's literally. Um, so it's kind of a parallel story because that wiped out a bunch of stores. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I can remember... Um, it took John a number of years and donations from the community to get him started again. I don't know um, what all involved was involved with that. I just remember people hitting me up and saying, do you have anything extra you could donate to if, like products? Because um, they wanted to decorate his new store as like a gift and like frame old modules and stuff. And um, But it, it was, it was, it was kind of crazy how, uh, how many game stores were just kind of taken out by by two calamities like that um, mm -hmm. to give you guys an opportunity maybe but um i know that uh as time went on a bunch reopened right in both places right um and nick you kind of you kind of uh coordinated with those other stores right where you guys kind of tried to make sure that you didn't necessarily stomp on toes or I don't know. Definitely. Yeah. So from the start, we knew that we wanted to cooperate with the other stores in our area. Our community is about 115,000 people. So there's, there's room for there to be more than one game store option in the community. But we also know that it's better if there are two good stores where ones where the casual players go for this game and ones where the competitive players go for this game. And vice versa for different games. Maybe we have the competitive Warhammer, they have the casual Warhammer, but we have the competitive Magic people and they have the casual Magic people. Or something like that, where there's give and take that it's good to have two options for players and for the community as a whole. So we've always tried to communicate and work with those other stores. And that was something coming into where there were other existing stores, we knew that we wanted to take a look at their schedules and not run events on the same days they were and try to organize things on different days to see if that would work for different parts of the community that weren't being served by that store for whatever reason. And that's where we found a lot of uh, a goodwill from the community. And also a lot of people were very happy that we were trying to do something a little bit different. So um, I know part of that too was, you know, oh, if, if we run D&D &D on Wednesday nights, do you guys want to run it on Thursday nights? Yeah. And you would have people, customers go to both events. Yeah. Um, so you share customers in, in other yep. words. Exactly. Um, and uh, I don't know, Mac, Chris, have you guys done anything like that? Or I know, um, I know like plus one gaming is around. I'm not sure mm -hmm. of any other game stores, but. Oh, we, we have, a, I think we have a pretty healthy relationship with, with all the, the game shops in the area. Um, uh, especially after this most recent hurricane Ida, um, we uh, we worked with uh, Bad Wolf on the West Bank to uh, gather food and supplies for people that did not have the ability to get uh, anything from the shop, uh, the grocery stores, and things like that. Uh, we worked closely with formerly Big Easy Comics on the North Shore, but they unfortunately are no longer with us. Um, we worked well with them. Uh, D4 Cafe, we, we worked with them on both their PFS, their Pathfinder Society, and their Adventurers League. So we've, we've had a, a very healthy relationship with, with all the, the shops in the area. And I, I agree with Nick. That is 
we have a we have a much larger community, but um, it really is a great way to be able to to coexist, you know, and serve the community a lot better. Yeah, we do have a lot of different things kind of going on than, um, you know, like some places here, more Yu-Gi-Oh, we send, we have no problem like hooking people up with, um, with their, you know, same game community that plays in a different space. And uh, I don't think they have a problem doing that over here as well. So uh, this is kind of a question for everybody. We'll let John jump in first because um, I, I get a lot of questions from people on Instagram, on Facebook. So could I, I kind of throw out a web uh, or a net, if you will, and, and say, hey, I'm going to be doing this show this Friday if you guys have any questions for these guys. And I always get, like right now I'm overflowing. I've got a little over 100 questions uh, from people. But the number one question is about the customer base, which, which um, we, we have, a, have kind of a, a unique customer base and that some of them can be quite eccentric. Uh, and people are wondering, um, and it kind of goes back to, goes back to that community building. Um, they, they, and, and obviously the, the people that are giving, they're putting in their two cents um, are gamers themselves, uh, but they're all real interested in what, knowing about your favorite customers, your favorite customer story. And we're not looking to like dog on anyone for sure. We're looking for, uh, I think they're looking for humorous stories or, um, or just silly anecdotes. But John, do you have a, a favorite customer? Jeez, <laughs> I love them all. I loved them all, Matt. Let me just say that in case any of them happen to watch this. Um, you know what? Uh, here's the thing I, I'll say. It, it might not really answer the question directly, um, but I will say that I had a group of kids that I taught to play Dungeons & Dragons that first winter that we were open. We taught... The, I taught them how to play from the Moldvay BX edition, the, the original Red Box edition. And those kids are all 10 years older now. They're all 27, 28 years old, or you know what I mean? Or however old they are. And they still message me on Facebook and they're still playing Dungeons and Dragons and they still thank me for that. And so I will say that, it, it isn't a specific person, you know, but that feeling of that is cool. The downside to that is, is that feeling is hollow because it doesn't pay the bills, right? Like you guys have all kind of alluded to something, the idea that um, the game store of the 90s kind of thing where, you know, the guy that was there was always just playing a game or whatever. Well, Unfortunately, in small towns, I don't think you can get away from that. You, you have to be, there's just so few people there that you have to become friends with these people. One of the main, uh, you know, there were a couple of contributing factors to why we, we closed up. Uh, the first was that we had a group of guys, I was selling Warhammer really well. Nobody around this area was selling Warhammer. And in Toledo, there was two big stores up there that sold tons and tons and had a flourishing Warhammer communities, but pretty much from Toledo to Cleveland was just us. We had a really thriving Warhammer community and one of the kids two towns away convinced his mom to let him open up a game store in this garage space that they had and essentially he got he got Games Workshop to give him a G-Dub setup, the whole deal and it just decimated uh, my playgroup. So because it's just such a small community to begin with, having something like that happen was just crushing financially. Then, you know, when WotC opened up uh, magic card sales to Amazon, the price, when, when I was getting boxes, be, back then I was still getting my boxes directly from WotC before, you know, before they forced you to have to buy through distributors. But the prices I was paying for boxes through WotC were $2 more than what I could buy them from Amazon. 
Okay. So I'm buy, I was buying product on Amazon, still getting whatever I needed for my fulfillment for, you know, set releases and promos and all that stuff, Friday night magic. But the point was, is that all that stuff kind of crushed it down. It made it really hard to, to want to do it. So I started making miniatures. Well, the final nail in the coffin was I realized that at the end we were having three or four guys that came in regularly that demanded my attention because we, we were friends ish, if that makes sense. Like we were friends in that scenario of let's play commander. Hey, we need another guy to play commander. Do you want to play commander? And I, and I felt like I had to stop what I was doing with making miniatures and going and play with these guys. So the decision just became, look, we just have to close this up. I can't, split my duty like this so i guess what i'm getting at is is that it's just interesting talking to people who have are in a demographic situation where you can make the decision to not have to be involved with the customer on that level you can be the business owner and you know not and be able to make decisions solely for the business i had to allow there were certain people that i had to allow to come in and play who I wouldn't have allowed to come in and play. Like if I had to choose who I was hanging out with, I would have said, I don't want to hang around with this person. Right. But they're spending money at my store and I need the money to keep the store open. So it's, it's kind of interesting to hear a fresh perspective where I don't think you guys really have that situation or maybe you do. I don't know, but. I would say we most definitely have that situation. Um, I, I feel like what, what keeps people coming back to this place for so long is their sense of community. And a lot of the, the people who have been um, customers here have known Matt pretty much the entire time that he's been open and they do definitely demand his attention away from the store to play games with them. 100%. Some Sometimes it's forceful. Sometimes <laughs> it's very, violent it's forceful. very forceful. Well, <laughs> Mac, are, I assume you're playing. You're playing magic. Are you mostly a magic guy, or I don't? Or is it just anything across the board? I mean, it, it, it's pretty much everything. Uh, but for me, I cut my teeth on role playing games. That is that is my number one passion. That is my heart. That is the thing that I love so much because those worlds are so alive and real and yeah, absolutely something that you build a visceral experience from a fictional setting you know like a fictional thing and of course like we can all go out and you know raid a, a, a tomb and save a kingdom and still be at work for 9 a.m the next morning you know yeah. you can't say that about a lot of other activities that people do um so that's one of my favorite things about about the world yeah. but yeah they they uh, definitely uh they definitely pull my attention quite a bit. <laughs> I, think, I think without it sounding, I guess I'm not sure if it's coming across what I'm actually trying to say. The problem is it wasn't that I didn't enjoy the community. It's that there wasn't enough of a community for me to be able to enjoy it and pay the bills. No, I, yeah. I agree. That was really the crux, the crux of the problem. It's not mm -hmm. that I didn't like these people. It's that if I didn't have a game store, I probably wouldn't have ever known them and probably would not have crossed paths in life. They're all a lot younger. I'm a lot older than all of them. So there's that factor. Um, I was a lot better at magic than all of them. So, oh, <laughs> oh, wow. well, that was the problem is that I, I have some really good decks and I had pretty good, by the time it was over, I, I I'm just competitive by nature. I, just want to be the best at whatever it is that I'm doing and I never wanted to play magic and I remember very distinctly playing that kid Randy and playing him in a Friday night magic the kid I was telling you about that kept weeks for weeks coming in and asking me to play magic so I finally learned the game or at least I thought I understood the game and I bought this pre-con deck and I played him against it with I played against him on at Friday night magic and he skunked me and I thought <laughs> No, I see what it is. This kid's plan at that point, Snapcaster Mage was the, all the thing, man. It, yeah. it was just such a brutal deck. And that's what this kid's playing. And I'm, those were like 105 bucks a piece at the time. And I'm like, oh, so this is a game about money. Well, I've got more money than this kid. <laughs> and so <laughs> I went to another store. I net decked. I, bought, I built this super beastie burn deck that I thought would be great. 
but I didn't know how to pilot it at the time. And so I came into Friday Night Net Magic the next week and sat down against this smug little 14-year-old kid who stomped a mud hole in my ass again. <laughs> and I remember walking into the shop and throwing those cards down and going, I hate this shit. I don't ever want to do this. <laughs> So that's when I actually got the rule book out and learned how the stack actually functions. And then once I really understood priority and stack function, I went, oh, this is a computer. This is just a computer. And all I got to do is at this point, insert what I'm doing and, and really learning how the game worked made a huge difference. So anyway, the point of that whole story is Randy was one of my favorite, not favorite players. So back to the question <laughs> earlier, Randy got banned at the store. We banned like his, he was just rude. He was a very good magic player. He'd win Friday night magic every week, but he was just rude about it. And was really turning other people off. So my partner and I decided, look, we're going to ban this kid. And he was banned for a couple of weeks. And this is a 15 year old kid at this point. And I'm feeling horrible. He looks like I'm being mean to a little kid. And he sends me a message through Facebook. Like, please, please, can I come back? Cause that's all this kid has. And so at that point we were still doing the, the membership thing. So I took a poll amongst all the members and I, I let them all vote you, uh, anonymously, okay? And the funniest part of the story was, is one of the kids wasn't there. And this kid was friends with Randy, or at least I thought he was friends with Randy. Because when it came down to the vote, he wasn't there for the vote. So I let him vote on his own. So he's the only person I knew what his vote was. <laughs> And he voted no Randy. <laughs> so, so I trumped the whole deal and said, I can't be mean to a 15-year-old kid. Randy can come back to the store. And we sat down and talked to him. So there's all of that kind of thing that, like, you hate to use the term, like, fatherly influence or whatever. That's all the enjoyable stuff for me. Uh, if I would have been making money at it, I'd still be doing that. You know, because that end of it is, that's, there's a fulfilling part to you that so like you were saying about role playing mac um you know when you role play with people especially new people that first experience being able to have that first shared experience with them i think back to 1979 when we were allowed to sit at the table with my best friend's brother's group playing and sit there and shut up and listen to us for a while and that was like two sessions of us fascinated with this and then on the third session, we got to roll up hireling characters that were, you know, just fodder for their game. <laughs> and we, we, I mean, that was it. We were off to the races at that yeah. point. So I think about being able to provide that experience for a younger generation. That's, that's the amazing parts of it to me. Just wish there was more money. I wish I was in a bigger town. <laughs> I, I wish I was in New Orleans. Man. Yeah. <laughs> or Springfield. Mac, Mac has to roll out. Uh, yeah. So I want to thank you for, for coming on, even a short, short time. And I'll see you guys tomorrow if you're in the shop. But uh, um, we'll hopefully have you on again sometime and, and talk some more. Any, anytime. I, I apologize about tonight. I, uh, I didn't realize that uh, this uh, was going to be a, a longer episode. So I, I was only able to get away for about an hour. And I have to get going again. No, that's all right. Um, but no, I, I really would love to carry on this conversation. Like I honestly, uh, Nick and John, if if you guys wouldn't mind uh, sharing your contact information with with Chris, um, I would love to pick your brains on some of your experiences. Like uh, I, I I would love to see like how John how you used your membership system in the beginning because we are running into some issues of uh, uh, membership fatigue as far as like getting new members and retaining retention of those members, even though we are putting in tons of amenities into the space. Uh, and then of course, with, with Titan Games, uh, we would love to pick your brain on like some of the events that you guys are doing for casual. Um, I'm really trying to find a way to resurrect the store from what we were before, which is we went 100% retail with no gaming space yeah. uh, for the pandemic. And yep. uh, we we started doing some minor e-com stuff and then when chris came on we did major e-com stuff um which is all great and all but now i'm trying to facilitate uh, getting players back into the shop 
uh, getting that type of energy back into the store. And I, I would love to maybe talk to you guys on, on a, a, another day or something where yeah. we compare notes. That'd be amazing. Of course. But yeah, guys, thank you so much for having me, Matt. I will see you tomorrow. I'm the person yep. who's working with you tomorrow, so right. uh, <laughs> none of this. It's gonna be this guy. Am I going to? <laughs> I believe so. Um, okay. But yeah, um, I gotta give you your computer. Just locked up in the office. Is that okay? Okay. All right. I have to get going. I apologize. Okay. Thank you, guys. Thank you. I gotta answer this. I'm gonna mute for a second, guys. Go for it, Nick. Yeah, so, Nick. I you have obviously. All I right, guys. I'm gonna oh, also Chris. I'm gonna also say goodbye. We have to. I have we to, have we have to. We have to close out the store too. I don't so. know if that was like. <laughs> I'm so sorry. Oh yeah, we understood. Oh, I understood. I'm sorry, Chris. Okay. All right. So. Well, it was so nice to meet all of you guys. Yeah. Oh, nice to meet you also. Thank you for having me. If you're not currently carrying Cobalt Press's material, you should definitely carry their material. We do. We carry. I gotta get my plug in. We absolutely do. It okay, sells very have. well. Yeah, we, we absolutely do. Yeah, so we we make all their miniatures. So nice. That's that's so cool to get to meet you. <laughs> yeah, we need to have a conversation outside of this because I have questions about the new Kickstarter miniatures and everything. So certainly, Nick, absolutely. We'll just yeah, definitely. You talking? Definitely want to talk more to you guys, but I will. Y'all have fun. Yeah, see gonna, nice meeting talk you. Talk to you later. Bye. All right, so Nick, I know that uh, I have seen. Your your community building there at the Springfield store has been, you know, I talked to obviously a lot of the players outside of outside of the shop. Um, even today, now that I've moved, we have a large chat room, and you know we we're, we're, we banter around a lot, and um, they still talk about Titan Games even during the pandemic. They're like, oh, we need to get the tables open and. You know, um, and obviously you're having some of the same challenges getting getting jump started again. But I think going back to your favorite non friend non friend customer, I don't know how else to describe it. Sure. Um, John John had a very illuminating um, a very illuminating anecdote there with Randy, but uh, I'm sorry. sorry that went on so long. No, it's good. It's not good. <laughs> well, I mean, I think I there, there's a lot of favorite customers over the years, and it's really hard to pick just one because we had some people that were excellent for helping us build the community and really bought into what we were trying to do in the community and almost really championed it for us outside of the store as well. And those are people that regardless of how much money they would spend in the store, they were advocates for the store and they made the store successful by helping us grow that community with people who were spending money at the store, even if they weren't necessarily spending as much as other people. Um, on the flip side, over the years, we've had a number of customers that I really uh, liked because of they helped my bottom line a ton. And I remember in the first year or two, we were open in Springfield there was a gentleman that came in once a week. I never learned his name. I don't know why. I just never asked him, but it was like clockwork. Once a week, he'd roll in. He'd look at all the magic cases. He'd pick up a couple of D&D books. He'd pick up a couple of games. He'd buy a couple of magic cards, and he'd drop six, seven, eight hundred bucks once a week in the store. And it's like, you're keeping the doors open, dude. Like, I love you. <laughs> just keep coming back, you know? So it's one of those, like, you have those customers that kind of come and go, though. So it's hard to really pick any one of them because that person that's spending a bunch of money in the store but never partaking in any events at the store is doing something completely different than the person that's helping us build a community of people that are regularly inside the store, regularly spending money in the store, and doing things day to day. So it's, it's one of those tough things, like, like I said, they're just two completely different aspects of a successful store is having the community and being able to pay the bills. You have to have both of them, like John said. Otherwise, you end up without a store really quickly. And I, before we actually started, John, you had you had mentioned about how, you know, you had a lot of people who would roll in after you had ended your subscription model. Um, they would roll in and you're like, it's great that you're here playing games, but they wouldn't spend a cent. They would just kind of take up space. And, and <laughs> I know for a fact that th that was kind of the case with the D&D players for, for Nick, except for Grandma's Cookies. Um, yeah. 
Yeah, we ate a lot of grandma's cookies. But yeah, we, there, was, there was a point in time where there were probably 40, 45 D&D players in the store all at one time. And so we, yeah, we made probably one of the most difficult decisions as a store when this was probably two years before you left, Matt. We transitioned from a free to play D&D night to a system where you had to essentially buy a ticket every event that you were playing. And it, the way we set up the system, you essentially got the same amount of store credit out of the system as you put in. Or your DM got that store credit out of the system, essentially in almost a one-to-one. -one. I think it was $4 in store credit versus a $5 buy-in. So 80% of it comes out automatically. But when we made that transition, we went from having like seven tables with eight to nine people at a role-playing table to where we had six tables with no more than seven players. That was an absolute cap. And it improved the quality of play for everybody that stuck around. And quite frankly, I think a lot of the people that we lost in that transition were people that were maybe buying a soda. It's like, I'm sorry, but that just does not keep the doors open at this point. Yeah. So... Well, I remember I, I took, when I would get, we'd get store credit and we had weekly prizes. Yeah. My table, yeah. they would flip out for that. They were like, you know, and then we had a monthly prize and yeah, we went crazy for that sort of stuff. That was a lot of fun yeah. though. Um, yeah, our original intention was that this will help the DMs kind of pay for modules or pay for miniatures. Because as you both know, and everybody listening probably knows, the DMs tend to handle the brunt of most of the costs with an RPG. As a player, you maybe buy one, two books and a couple of minis. But as the DM, you got to have everything else <laughs> that makes the game interesting, right? Absolutely. So our original intention was, hey, this is a way for our DMs to kind of subsidize all of that expenditure so they can make a better game. A lot of our DMs had already kind of planned those expenditures into their budgets. So they were able to just say, you know what? We're just going to do something cool for the players. So now, like Matt's group did, they started having weekly prizes and monthly prizes so those players are paying a little bit to play but then they're getting a really cool prize once a month you know and it worked out really nicely for everybody i think yeah i think it was a lot of fun i i still remember i, still have, I showed you some of those tickets uh, yeah. but uh, i i still have a lot of fond memories of that because i my wife will tell you i'm a gift giver like yep. i i live to like Christmas time, I go too far. Birthdays, I go way too far. <laughs> um, so it was like every week was Christmas kind of thing by just giving all that away. But uh, that was a lot of fun. So, so um, John, you had to make a difficult choice with Randy there. And I know, like, you recall I used to run a game for kids on Saturdays, Nick. Yep. And those kids would oftentimes get in arguments among the, amongst themselves, not even in the store. So like they'd walk in with a chip on their shoulder from something that happened at school. And I can remember having, um, it would happen, it, this particular time happened during, it was on the day of a big boss fight. They're fighting a big giant dragon. We were running the, the rise of Tiamat. And the person that was mad at everybody else was the cleric. And once they got embroiled, he refused to heal anybody. <laughs> and everybody oh, man. Had grudge. And oh. so I was like, these are kids. I was like, I think we need to rewind here. And I pulled everyone aside. I'm like, listen, I don't know what's going on, but this is silly. You know, this is just. Um, and so basically we reset the encounter and started over again. Um, but I know that invariably there are conflicts in stores you know and and much like any community there's a lot of different personalities maybe not so much in the john's case not as many personalities but there are always a lot of personalities hey look uh, if every one of your kids seems to have three separate personalities that adds up a lot faster than you might think yes it, it does <laughs> it really does and i can remember um being in the store on magic night and somebody um somebody not understanding how a rule worked and the other player just went with it. And then later on, everyone realized, Hey, this is, this is not how it's supposed to go. And the person that lost the game started yelling, you cheated me. You cheated me. Like, 
as if it was on purpose. So I know there are a lot of conflicts and I know that everyone wants to keep that, that community, um, that community going. So I guess, John, how did you have to handle bringing Randy back to your group? And, and Nick, what are some of your um, more uh, gravelly in instances and how, how, how did you go about resolving that? And did you, you know, did you put, um, if there was a friend involved or an acquaintance, did that make a difference to you? Well, I specifically lied. <laughs> I brought I brought Randy back and, and just told everybody, look, I'm very sorry. I, you know, this is a 15 year old boy. I will do my best to make sure that he's not offensive to you. But, you know, you guys voted. I said, you guys voted to let him back. I know some of you aren't going to be happy about that, but that's the way it goes when you have like a quote unquote club. And, you know, the conflict thing, you're, you're right, Matt. It's very weird that, you know, as a competitive person, it's very weird to watch other people be hyper competitive at a game. Okay. So I, I kept finding myself having to reel myself back in. So I get it. But now, like looking back on it, I'm like, ah, it's just a game, you know, like, the, you know, the, you're really sucking a lot of the fun out of it if, if your only purpose is to win at the game. And so, you know, I, I don't know what the solution to that is, to be honest. I think you're always going to have a certain, a certain mindset of person. Well, one of the things that we said about Randy is that he invested a lot of his um, self-worth. He invested a lot of his self-worth in his ability to play a game. Okay. And, to that end, when he was successful at it, it came across as very smug, like very, well, you know, of course I won, you know, it came across that way. And I, you know, I never could get to the bottom of whether he feels that way or not. I'm not sure if he actually felt superior for winning Friday Night Magic, you know, 32 consecutive Fridays or whatever. But, you know, I just, I remember having a talk with him specifically saying, look, the reality is, is that, do you think you're going to be a pro magic player? If you are, I'll stand behind any decision you make and I'll help you try and get there if I can. Okay. But if you, you know, the reality is that the pros are very narrow. And so if you don't, if you have so much invested into being good at this and your only caliber of measure is being a pro player on some regard, you better have something to fall back to. Okay. You're a really good magic player. He's really, really good magic player, but that game is a weird thing. Okay. Magic specifically, I remember like try I came up with an analogy for it, and people just do not to this day. I think maybe I'm the only one that looks at it. People think NASCAR, when NASCAR was originated, the idea was everybody drove the same car essentially, and you're testing the driver to the driver. Okay, so in theory, magic should be the same thing that winning at magic means you're a better magic player. But because of how the game works, mana is a system of pure luck. Yeah. Like just it's pure luck. If you have you have the best deck in the world and you draw not enough mana to act to keep the curve going of your deck, you're going to lose. So I think the, what I tried to explain to Randy is that, look, you're trying to bet your entire self-worth on luck. It's it's like trying to say, if I win the lottery, I'll be much happier. Yeah. You know, well, you know, and yes, there is skill in, involved in magic where there really isn't in the lottery technically, right? But so I don't know. I'm sorry. I've now meandered off the subject as I very often do. So I'm not even sure if I answered. It's that. all good, man. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, as far as, like, handling conflict in the store, we kind of have two different systems for doing that. Uh, one would be, you know, a situation like what you have where there's a disagreement amongst a couple people, and it usually comes down to 90% of the time, people are just kind of hot at the moment of things happening, and that creates the issue. And typically, if we can get that solution, get the 
people out of the same area or, you know, get people calmed down and talk to them the next day. I have found 90% of the time, anybody that has that kind of hot blow up the next day is extremely apologetic, understands what may have gone wrong and wants to resolve it most of the time. Um, and those are little things that are going to happen in any community of people, be they gamers, whatever. That's just people, right? And yeah. then there's a second set of uh, steps that we have built in as a company for, is this something that we feel somebody should theoretically be removed from the store for? And that is a much more involved process that involves multiple managers and owners being involved. Uh, interviews with all parties, including neutral parties. And it's a process that takes about three or four weeks usually. So we kind of have to have, we've kind of realized we need to have two different systems for this, depending on what type of an incident it is. But that's something when I first got involved with the store, we didn't really have any kind of procedures for this. But as instances have come up, we've built those procedures into our company as they came up. Um. I, uh, I've always found that, um, the game store for me is kind of like that hub of, of, of the gaming community. And I've always felt like, um, publishers and WotC and, and so forth, they haven't made it easy on you guys in the, in the least bit. Um, in fact, in fact, um, you know, I, I think that my personal opinion is, is the game store is like the number one place people learn to play Magic. Um, at least learn kind of the nuances of the game, right? And um, and you mentioned the, the issue with like marketing to Amazon, which might make a, a great business sense in a, in a, in a short term for, for WotC. Um, and maybe, I don't know, I, I don't look at their books. Perhaps even in the long term, it makes diff, you know, um, makes sense to them, right? But um, they, I, I wonder at the failure rate of, of game stores, or I look at the failure rate, I shouldn't say I wonder at it, and I, and I wonder what do you guys think of the future of gaming? Whether it's you know Amazon selling the books at at drastically reduced prices, um, and I, I know like I always tried to buy my books from Nick um, just because I wanted my dollars to go there. But not everybody is in a financial position to say, well, the twenty dollars difference that's a big deal to me, you know, um, and I still want to play this game, right? Uh, so. How do you, and that to me is another aspect of the community is having the people who are willing to spend a few extra dollars and, and how prevalent is that to you guys? I know you always have to, how, you have to hedge your bets, right? And you have to, you have to say, okay, um, we know that we're just not going to sell three or four copies of Access and Allies in a day. So I better not stock three or four copies of Access and Allies in the, you know, in the store. Um, so how how prevalent in, in the community do you think that is to be willing to make that sacrifice financially for, for to keep the store going? Depends on the age groups you're talking about. It depends on what your age demographic is. You know, um, there comes a point where, you know, financial financial quote-unquote security once that starts hitting um just my own personal example as an 18 year old if something was 20 dollars cheaper if a game was 20 dollars cheaper somewhere that's where i was buying it and no thought about the guy who's uh, i'll give you another john anecdotal story if you've got time to listen to this one this is something i just did was it last summer yeah it was last summer so you know i started playing very young in probably about 86 or 87 in Sandusky, there was a shop called A&B Hobbies over there. And West End Games Star Wars had just come out. The, the D6 Star Wars came out. And we used to go to we used to go to A&B Hobbies every Sunday and play D&D there. The guy that owned the store ran a D&D &D game and you know, it was like 15, 20 kids in there playing D&D. &D. 
And when they would all walk out, every one of them would steal something, right? Okay. Now, as a much awkward, much more awkward, poorer kid, I stole a copy of the D6 Star Wars. <laughs> so last summer, I had a buddy who was, who was just getting into making models. He had shoulder surgery and he was going to start assembling models. I said, you know, there's A and B hobbies. He, he closed... He closed his store down to this little tiny thing and he doesn't do D&D anymore and he's only got models. And, and I said, you know, part of me thinks that all of us kids really owe that dude a lot because we're the reason he's in a tiny little store instead of the big store he was in and blah, blah, blah. So when we went over there, I gave that guy 60 bucks. I, I, well, so I didn't know if the same guy still owned it. We're back there walking around and there he was. And I thought, oh, shit, man, he's still alive because he was a lot older than us even back then. And I called him to the side, uh, up to the front desk. I said, look, I know you don't remember any, me. And he goes, I remember you, John. And I thought, oh, shit. Okay. <laughs> I said, well, here's what I got to tell you. I need you to make a $60 null item through your register right now. And I need to give you $60. And he says, what for? I said, well, I figure it's at least somewhere close to the appreciation value of the D6 Star Wars hardback book that I stole from you in 1985 or whatever. And he, he, he got teared up and stuff and was like, wow, he goes, I, nobody's ever done anything like that before. The whole point of the story is that John at 52 understands what it's like to own a business and where you put your money matters, right? But if you expect that out of a 14 year old to maybe even up to 26 27 year old you're, you're not going to get that loyalty out of them so the future of game stores is tough these guys all said the same thing community is how you have to do it right you have to build a community where the other members of the community all believe in supporting the store for the good of having a place to play right? We got to We got to buy our stuff here because this is where we come every week to play. And if we don't buy it here, it goes away, right? I wasn't able to foster that in my situation, okay? So, you know, back to like Watsy, you know, without getting into slinging mud, but one of Watsy's biggest things, um, and I, it was just absolutely shocking to me, is that over 80% of their play for Magic the Gathering is estimated to be home tabletop playing. That's over 80% of the people that buy Magic play it at their house between their buddies. They play casual Magic with their buddies. When you start thinking about that from a business perspective, well, what are they going to do? They're not going to work for the friendly local game store. That can't be their, That can't be who they're shooting to bolster, even though it's our communities that keep it pushing forward on some sort of competitive level with Friday night magic and, you know, constant format rotation. And it's just, that was really eye opening to me to learn that number. So back to what you were saying, the, the future of the friendly local game store isn't bleak in large demographic areas, places that have a lot of people, you know, I think you're just going to see a lot more small town shops just shut if they're not already between you know, Watsy's business practices and COVID, if they've managed to make it through all that, then they are independently wealthy and it's a vanity business. <laughs> At least that's what I think. <laughs> so anyway, Nick, I'm sorry. I, I keep hogging all the question space. I mean, I do agree with a lot of things, including like the community aspect of it. Like you need to have a community that values what you're bringing to the table. And at the same time, like you have to, also as a business value that community and try to make it worth their while to do these things. Keep bringing um, yeah. I mean, if we just never bring in new product, then our community is not going to be interested in us anymore. So we have to constantly be providing that value, whether it's new stuff that they know about or new things that we hear about at conventions and can bring to them. That'll excite them about whatever game it is they're interested in playing. Um, so it does go both ways, but it's, is as far as a brick and mortar retailer, I've always worked in sales where you can buy whatever I'm selling cheaper online from somebody. The difference is the next time you need something, 
are you going to have somebody to ask about it? Am I, are you going to come to me and ask questions about a thing and I'll be able to answer those questions for you? Or are you going to just do a Google search and try to find the thing from whoever happens to have that thing cheapest? And that's where being able to answer those questions and be a resource for your community has helped build out a lot of these friendly local game stores and make them community centers. And that's really the way that we've had to move towards things in the future as well. Do you have a favorite event that you run? Not necessarily like the most profitable or the, the biggest, but do you have a favorite event that like you have like a really good time with? Um, yes, because I've gotten to play it a couple times. Uh, every, the week after, so the weekend of release for Magic, we run what's called a bundle challenge. Uh, with Before they changed up bundles, everybody got a Magic bundle, which was 10 packs, 10 draft packs, you built your 40 card deck out of those 10 draft packs. So it's just a crazy big pool of cards. Um, since they've messed around with how the fat packs are actually made, we now have made it two pre-release kits. So now you have 12 packs of cards plus two promos and you're building a minimum 40 card deck where typically you only have six packs. So you have this ridiculously huge pool of cards and you end up seeing a lot of really crazy decks in Magic with that. So... That's just been a lot of fun to see the weird things that people can come up with for a 40 card deck. John, I know you played a lot in your well, story. You had to, like, like relatively speaking to the, like Nick, I tried to get Nick to play so often and he never once gamed with us <laughs> because he was always busy. The, but, the issue uh, was, yeah, what you go back to one of the questions from way earlier, what was one of the misconceptions of opening a game store that you'd get to play games all the time? Yeah, that's <laughs> not true at all. Like you... You end up working more on the business and playing very few games, it seems like. Well, um, you know, I'll, I'll still go back to the same thing. I think beginner Dungeons and Dragons, like just finding people that had never played the game or had very limited experience with it and just taking them on their first things and knowing, knowing for the ones that it stuck with, knowing that you were creating something that will never be able to be created for them again. You know what I mean? Like, that's the first experience with role playing, and it's it's not for everybody, but for the people that it's for, it every I guarantee you and Nick both can tell me your very first gaming story, the very first it, the the characters that were involved, who was at the table. You could probably tell me what you ate that day. All of that, and it's all tied to that one specific memory. So, being able to create that for somebody was was probably my favorite event you know it, that that first winter was really special for me i gotta say that that though that group of kids had such a blast and they i think only one of them doesn't still currently play dungeons and dragons the rest of them it's pretty good play all the time you know that was before fifth edition came out so i transitioned those kids we went from basic expert and then the next play test came out when it was still being called Dungeons and Dragons Next. Okay. And we got the Watsy play test rules and I read through them and okay, we're making new characters and, and this is what we're doing. And we played through the play test and did all the play test packs and all that. And then those guys all kind of moved on to play uh, fifth edition. It's funny as one of those kids the other night just posted a picture on Facebook. I don't talk to him all that much anymore, but he bought the Goodman Games reissue of Keep on the Borderlands. Yeah. <laughs> he had it po posted up on uh, Facebook, and he tagged me in it. He was like, remember this? And I'm like, yeah, that was your first adventure. That was the first place you went. You went to the Keep in the Caves of Chaos. So it, it did make that impression for people. So I felt like I was making that impression at the time, but that's my confirmation that it actually did make that impression. So... You know, 5th edition has brought in a lot of new players, a lot. And I can remember running games at, at Nick's store, um, and we would have a horde of people at a table at a time. This was before you made you shifted gears. We might have 14 players at the table. Yeah. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. That's, that's, that's too much. <laughs> yeah, it was. Uh, that's why we made changes. <laughs> we uh, – but, but I – I, what I thought was interesting is that there were several players, older players, um, who this was the, this was their first introduction to Dungeons and Dragons. 
Um, you remember Wolf? Now, Wolf wasn't a new player yeah. in the game, but he's moving back to Springfield. Okay. Uh, and from back from Denver. Um, but he still talks, like, because he's in the chat room. And he still talks about, oh, what's what's going on at Titans, you know? And, yeah. like, it, it, like, for the years that he's been gone, um, he's been asking questions. And I think that goes to show, like, um, that you did a really good job of building the community there because – you know, we have this ch these chat rooms and, you know, tons of people who have moved on. Um, the two people that stand out most in my mind were this guy. I won't, I won't name their names because the guy was a retired CIA guy. CIA, he wasn't like an agent or anything. He just worked yeah. there, right? Um, although he said he did get to fly a drone once. He had some interesting stories. Um, and by fly a drone, he got to push a button once. <laughs> yeah. That's, that, that was his story. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yes, that's literally what it was. And uh, but he and his wife had never played D&D &D before and they but they had seen it on YouTube. You know, YouTube's gone a long way to to build the community and, and they religiously played until they moved away. I think they moved to Texas. He got a job in Texas. And um you know, they still message on the board and they're just like because what was built there in Springfield seems to be whether it's wolf in in denver or these these folks in texas um there are other people like um there's another guy he got a job he graduated college um and got a job with nasa and moved out to uh out to the west or east coast sorry out to the east coast um and he was doing something sciencey with it but in all those cases the game stores that they go to now pale in comparison they they you know message oh you know we miss you guys we wish it was that good you know we wish so i think it goes that's that says a lot you know yeah. to uh to what you you were doing there and i know with covid you are now in a position where you're kind of having to finally have the opportunity to have those tables again and kind of slowly rebuild that um and what do you are do you have a strategy of that or are you just kind of like hoping that these guys trickle in the door so we're really at the very beginning of this process um because in illinois we've had um a lot of issues with flare-ups and different things uh throughout different variants but we also just as a company weren't really comfortable maintaining open tables during that time either but we talked about opening D and D back up late last year, kind of before the Omicron bump and everything, when things were starting to look pretty good. Um, and about that time, our two managers, our our one owner and our manager from the Champagne Store, they went to Gen Con and tried playing D and D in a room at a table with six people wearing masks, and they were like, it was horrible. Like nobody could hear anybody. So at that point, we were like, you know what? We're not going to do it. We don't want players to come back and have a bad experience. So we pushed that off until really now I'm just starting to reach out to the DMs that were running things in store um, to discuss when they would want to run something, if they're ready to run something, because we have a much more limited play space now, as I kind of told you earlier, we want to make sure the people that had been running games for us have the first opportunity to run games again in store before all the time slots are filled up by random person that showed up the day I started taking applications or something like that. So it's, it's kind of on a, a hope and a dream right now to see who comes back, what comes back, how that gets involved. But I also am very confident that the community that we've built will at least in part come back. And the parts that do come back are going to be some of the best parts of it. So it will feed into itself. So I'm not too worried about it. It's just a matter of, is this something that's a six month project or a two year project kind of deal? So yeah, I know that literally just starting. <laughs> I talk to a lot of people who they lament missing, like they're all playing online and they're like, I yeah. want to play in person again. Yeah. It's just not the same. Like, Online, doing stuff like this with video chat, it was an okay stopgap, you know? But it really is not the same as sitting down at a table with some people and having multiple conversations going on at the table at one time. That's a big thing you can't do with the online. 
And it may just be me talking to Matt and telling him about this ridiculous little thing that I built into my character that we'll probably find out about later while nobody else is listening. That's just kind of a fun conversation, you know? Yeah. And those are the things that you can't do in this format, unfortunately. That is true. And, you know, um, it's it's one of those things, too, where um, I think role-playing games are about human interaction. They're not about oh, yeah. dice. Yeah. Not, to me. Maybe there are about some people, but to me, they're about human interaction. And like you said, it's difficult in this format. I mean, well, that's something just D&D and role playing as a whole. I think some people will get really bogged down in the rules of the game. And, you know, we all know the term rules lawyer and how they affect games as they enter and play. But for me, some of the best role playing experiences I've had, we barely rolled dice. You know, it was a story and a puzzle that we had to figure out. We didn't have miniatures. We're just going theater of the mind, walk, talking through what we're doing, having to ask the DM, you know, hey, I think I'm probably close enough to do this. Does that work? Yeah, I think you're in that position, you know, and those are the games that you really remember are the ones that have a great story. And I think a lot of people start into D&D, get buried in the technical parts of it and forget that this is a game 100% about you telling a really cool story with your don't, friends. Don't tell Jeff D that. <laughs> He'll lose his mind. <laughs> I mean, that's what brings people back, though, is having fun with Absolutely. friends and having a cool story. Absolutely. So um, last question for everybody. Uh, what was your first game store? Like, not that you owned, but <laughs> your first game store that you went in and got hooked on something. I know, John, you may have mentioned it a little bit earlier, but... Uh, no, I mean, that wasn't A&B Hobbies. That, that was, I mean, that was when I was already driving. I had already been playing for years by the time we started playing there. Um, surprisingly, my first game store wasn't a game store. It was a Radio Shack here in Port Clinton. Um, who happened to have, we, we, had, we had played for a couple of years with the Holmes Blue Box and the AD&D books that one of our other buddies had bought. But I remember walking into this Radio Shack with the, the uh, Errol Otis covered basic set and seeing that up on the shelf along with, uh, I can't remember who made it, but there was the plat, they were thermoform vac formed there were two miniature sets where it was a castle and a dungeon side of it. And they had all these really bad plastic miniatures that were ripoffs of uh, either Ralph Parth or Grenadier miniatures or whatever. And I remember saving up enough money and like mowing lawns and anything I could do, scraping money together to buy both of those from this radio shack, which wasn't a game store. That was before I could drive. And so and I also had, there was also a paperback store in town that I convinced the lady to carry some stuff. So she actually, you know, she got miniatures in there. You know, it was like, I don't know. I, I went in there and, you know, just kind of didn't spend enough money there. So those are early experiences of not game store. A and B was probably the first real quote unquote game store that we walked in and it was just, you know, and this is the heyday of it. So there's, you know, racks of just everything, you know, every GURPS thing that was made, every, you know, Twilight 2000, when it, you know, all that stuff was just exploding all over in there. So, yeah, that was a cool experience. That's another one, though. That's a good thing to bring up, Matt, because that's another one that you'll only have once. You'll have that experience one time where, you, as a gamer, where you just walk into the one store that just goes, holy shit, you know? Yeah. But So, uh, oddly for me, my first real game store was Titan Games, but it's sort of in two parts, because I started playing D&D with one of the other owners of the store when we were in our buddy's basement and we're like 10 years old. However, at that point, like, I would ask my parents for stuff and I have no idea where they got it. Like I didn't go to a game store to buy that stuff. So it was one of those weird, like maybe I technically had one at that point in time, but I don't know what it was. Um, I mean, I did start getting into painting and miniatures 
type stuff with the way a lot of much older people did with model planes and model cars and stuff like that, that we got at slot and wing hobbies in Champagne. But I didn't really start getting into more gaming type stuff until I was in my mid to late twenties. And that's where I started getting interested in board games and the X-Wing miniatures game. And I walked into a store that was owned by my buddy and it was awesome. And I'm like, this is where I want to play. This is where I want to buy stuff. This is fine for me. And then it was just reinforced as I started traveling to play X-Wing a little more competitively. And I would go to these stores and just be like, is this your store? This store like, sucks. Really? <laughs> this, is, this is what you guys go to every week? Like, you know, and there were some that were better and some that were worse. But it was just that whole like, okay, I just hit a home run the first store I walked into in my 20s. I'm just going to keep going there. And then it just got reinforced as I continued to see other places, go other places and travel a little more. And then they got me involved with the store and it has continued to be my store for a lot of good reasons like that. My, you know, my, go ahead, John. Walden books was another thing. Yeah. Yeah. Was, yeah. So like that was another, you know, it wasn't a game store. So yep. small town America, we just, the game store thing just wasn't a thing. Yeah, but I actually got one of my first jobs. Well, it was my third job, I guess, technically, but um, was at Walden Books just for the discount. <laughs> yeah, and we had the TSR rep that would come in and make sure everything was stocked <laughs> and then move on, you know. Um, but they, my first game store was like probably like 1981 and it was Black's Hardware. Okay, um, and they had one spinner rack. And all the dice behind the counter, because for some reason the little dice would vanish. Um, but uh, yeah, Black's Hardware, and and obviously the hardware guys had nothing about gaming. And and my very first game was not actually D and D. Not now that I think about it, it was actually Boot Hill. Uh, mm -hmm. That was my first game purchase. Really? Um, and with I with my own money, that is. I mean, I had played sure. D and D with my brother, much like John's. John's situation, although my brother never told me to shut up or anything. He was very supportive. <laughs> but uh, you guys were a lot older than us, like four and five years older. Oh, my brother was five, oh. six years older. Let's see. Oh, wow. Six years older than I was. Um, but he's always, he's like, was one of those guys that's like, hey, man, that's my brother. You better leave him alone, you know, kind of thing. Um, so, uh, yeah, Boot Hill. I still have that box. Boothill. Um, and, uh, but that was a lot of fun. Of course, you know, Boot Hill was tailor made for one shots. You know, you just go in, shoot up the town and then ride away. Right. Right. Not big, long story arcs a whole lot. Like, <laughs> right. unless, unless you had the right person running the game who was seriously into Western culture, you know? Yeah. I think, I think that's what happened with a lot of the TSR titles other than Dungeons and Dragons. Like Gamble World had a little bit of campaign. You could really play campaign, but Top secret, it, unless you were really into James Bond spy stuff, long-term campaigns just seem to peter out like that. My Even brother Star Frontiers was kind of hard to get a campaign going for. But well, we played Star Frontiers and Top Secret extensively. Um, in fact, I think it was around like 86 or 87. We had no idea that Gygax was gone and that that uh um you know Buck Rogers was the next thing. My brother wrote a letter to TSR saying, "When's the next Star Frontiers thing coming out?" Because we've done everything, and oh they wrote they wrote him back and say, "Basically, never." <laughs> yeah. uh, so that was cool, but uh, yeah, we were just we just soaked up games as as much as we could. But, but Walden Books was our second game store, and then I think I don't know if you, Nick, you weren't in Springfield at the time, so Metropolis City was that 1990s game store where you couldn't get the attention of anybody to help you. Um, and it was, um, I remember it was in Springfield. You know what Mr. Egg Roll is? Yeah. So Mr. Egg Roll was there then. And you drive down that, 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 that sloping, I don't know what street that is, but. Underneath route, yeah. Yeah, and back down there on the left, there's this two-story building and it's really like, the bottom floor was actually the basement. And yeah. on the back side there in the corner was where Metropolis City was. You could never find it. It was, but 
um, you know, they had lots of games and comics. So, yeah, I've that's the weird thing. Like, I moved into a town that I knew a couple of people in and opened up a game store. So, it was one of those like the first year, the few people I knew it was like, well, I hope you guys know other people that I can convince to play games. <laughs> but um, it was just weird for me because, you know, I moved from, so I actually grew up about seven miles from Champaign. That's where the original store was. That's where I spent my college years. Um, and it went from, I know this community to, I know nobody. And how do we make this work? And it had to be through building a community. But it was cool to see, like, the things that are expected of a good store are expected of a good store, no matter what town you're in. Like those things, having a clean space is good for everybody, you know? But as I lived here, you keep hearing about all these old stores and it's like, yeah, the attrition rate in game stores is pretty high. Did I get into the right business? Was this a good call? <laughs> but then, I mean, we're still here, so I, I can't say anything else other than I'm really happy that we're here, and I think that we've done a lot of things right, whether it was by good fortune or good planning. So hearing of all the stores that came before you, though, it's always weird to be like, okay, so this store was really good with this thing that they did, and then this store came along after it, and they had this thing that they did really good. Okay, and you just kind of learn the history of the game store, which is kind of its own neat little underworld history in a small town as well. Yeah, I I, uh, I can't tell you how many stores went through Springfield, though. I mean, it's staggering. Um, and, of course, the stores that also had comics, they're taking a double hit now, you know, because comic, the comic industry is really suffering. Um horrendously it's a weird industry to be in right now and that's something we've never carried comics and a lot of people have asked us to over the years and it's one of those like i've never been a comic book person none of our owners were ever comic book people it's just not an interest that we carry nor do we have the knowledge to be successful in it so it was one of those we've always passed on it and a lot of the other retailer groups i'm in multiple multiple people have said you know we got rid of comics in the last four years, and it's like, why? Okay, yeah, that makes sense. That's one of the oh, concerns guys. we had. Yeah. yeah. It, it seems like, and from my, this is my limited knowledge, but the people I've spoken to who have carried comics basically have felt that the distributors had the attitude of, we're going to let you carry our comics, and we're going to tell you what you're going to carry, yep. uh, rather than you getting to pick and... and and carrying the things that you know your customer base might be interested in rather you're going to buy what we want you to buy and and it was very very backwards uh situation so it's just but. weird to see like there are definitely comic book stores out there that are killing it right now and it's one of those things i couldn't tell you with my life was on the line what they are doing specifically that makes them a success over any of the hundreds of comic book stores that have closed over the years. Like, is it just that they've built the community? Well, is that the be, thing that defines be, it? Because it has to be, you have to have, you know, your weekly pulls for, yeah. you've got to have enough of a customer base that you're hitting probably 80% of the minimum buys for the week from your weekly pulls. Because yeah. when, when Diamond, when I, we had looked into doing comics and the, the answer was that, for the no was well what do i do with all the things that nobody buys well they're yours what to like, light on like, fire yeah you know, weekly is it weekly monthly or the weekly white dwarf from games workshop which yeah. i think they're back to monthly now yeah. but yeah they had a minimum i had to buy 10 of those every single week i was just billed to my card 10 of them would show up i'd sell two of them i i threw when we moved this shop over to here i threw four giant boxes of those into the dumpster because they're not worth anything at all like not even not even to sell on ebay there is zero value to them like 50 cents yep. well, it's not even worth trying to package and ship for 50 cents no. so uh, comic books i think fall into that category where if they have a new hot release and they say well you have to have you have to take five copies or six copies and you don't have 
six people that want that book, it's just not happening. You're, yeah. you're just eating that cost to carry the things that your people do want, you know? Mm-hmm. No, thanks. That's a horrible, horrible industry. Well, yeah. and I know for a long time they were held up by the collectible side of comic books as well. And I don't know if that's still the case, that maybe that's where some of the stores are bridging the gap. That might be too. You know, they've just got such a backstock. We have a huge, um, it's, you know, one town over, but Rupps has been in business for 25 years. And that's all Chris does. And I mean, he's just got this massive warehouse of comics. He, it's, mm-hmm. it's, it looks, and this is no exaggeration. If I could get you pictures of it, it's like the end of Raiders of the Lost Ark. <laughs> Um, that is not you walk in you know how you you know how you can look at like an 80s you know you look at an 80s marvel comic like a scan like a pdf of an 80s marvel comic and you can smell that book (laughs) i know exactly what that's what that whole warehouse you walk in it's like whoa (laughs) it's like old newsprint Mm -hmm. stuff but but he does the you know, a ton of collectible business, you know, a lot of what he does. And it, and it's not just the books too. It's, you know, Funko Pops and all the other crazy things that seem to be tied to that. He never branched into role-playing games. I think mm-hmm. they did, uh, for a minute, they were doing uh, Hero Clicks when that was really huge. Like, I think he did that for a while, but, you know. Yeah. Hero Clicks is another thing that seems like it's very hit or miss right now, too. Just either the community exists for it or it doesn't. And trying to build it up is not necessarily worth the time to do it. Yeah, that's, uh, I found that, you know, I, I get rabid. Like when I get into a game, I'm like rabid about it. You know, like Nick, I don't know how much I bugged you about <laughs> Lord of the Rings LCG. You know, uh, just every day for like a year. Don't worry about it. Yeah. And, uh, <laughs> I, you know, I just like, I think that everybody should love that game, right? Yeah. And yeah. that was, that was always my big failing is just like, I never really would understand the business side of it. I just knew like there were games that I really wanted to get in on and I had to own them all. I had to have all the expansions. I had to have everything, right? Um, and I think, I think uh, now the new thing is because I, because I bought it from you, Nick, what is is Twilight Imperium? Yeah. Um, so we got a weekend, like we had friends up and and we played a whole weekend, one game. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and uh, um, but even Am was hooked on it. My wife was hooked on it, and Am she didn't really understand the rules real well. So we played for like a solid two weeks. Like after dinner, we would sit down and just grind through the rules and figure out all these different strategies so the next time one particular friend of ours would come up jeff who's really good at the game um that we would gang up on him and he's coming back in a few weeks (laughs) yeah Yeah. i mean that is a wonderful game and it's a big game and that's one you definitely have to have a weekend day to play the game and hope you get through to the finish depending on who all is playing with you yeah, I think we we started on a Friday night and we finished on a Sunday just a few hours before he had to leave. Yeah. So, yeah, it's it's a monstrous game, but uh, but a lot of fun. It is a lot. But of there's fun. so many there's there's so many different parts to that game though. Like you can play for that long and feel like you just did a role playing session for you know seven hours, but it was intriguing. It was interesting. Things were going on the whole time. You're negotiating alliances, negotiating trade deals. There's just so much going on that the time passes and no, like you don't feel like the time is passing at all. It's just, oh, it's midnight. We should probably, you know, get some rest before we play tomorrow. <laughs> there's, uh, there's a certain uh, gaming convention coming up that some of my friends are signed up for Twilight Imperium and it's like a 10 hour slot set aside. Yeah. And um, they're going to go in pretending they don't know one another. And, oh, that's dirty. Trying to stack dirty. the table. Dirty. And I was like, oh my God, I wish I could be there. Yeah. But you know what's going to happen though is that they won't be able to control themselves because I know them. And yep. they are going to betray each other early on. 
because one of them's what's going to happen is one of them's going to leave a back door open and the other one's going to go, hmm, you know, I could have three extra worlds right now and yep. they'll do it. You know, remember the last time we played and you backstabbed me for that? Yeah, this is the payback. <laughs> <laughs> that is literally what will happen. I guarantee you. So, so whatever. It's uh, good times. But all right. Well, it's nine o'clock or a little after. So uh, I want to thank you guys for coming on, John, again. And um, I hope, hope to get, get you on again and pick your yeah. brain about stuff because it's been a lot of fun. I'm sure Nick's going to be in touch. Or yeah. Nick, Mac, Mac, the other guy. Yep. Mac and Chris are going to be in touch. Um, but uh, yeah, I, I'm anxious to have you guys back sometime and just talk about other things too. Sure. So it'll be a lot yeah. of fun. Anytime, Matt. I got one, a couple more months before the restaurant gets going again. Once the restaurant's going, Friday nights are out for me for till fall. But right on. Well, and I never asked you what what is your restaurant? Steak and seafood restaurant on the waterfront. So oh, okay, like, like boat dockage, the whole nine yards. So nice on Lake Erie. You said yeah. Well, right on. I finally, I finally bought the property. I've been I've had it for eighteen years. And then finally bought the property last year. So, well, congratulations with that. Yeah, it's just kind of a weird, different feeling about it now. Kind of always felt like I just worked there. <laughs> so, but the now chef? you are. Yeah. Are you the Stop. chef? What'd you say? Are you the chef? No, 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 no. I primarily bartend there. That's, I mean, my probably 90% of what I do there is bartending. All right. Uh, but, you know, I cook, I do whatever I got to do. What You know, yeah. that's what owning a business is. I don't care if it's a game store or a restaurant or whatever. Your job as the owner is everything else that nobody else has done, right? Then if you don't have many employees, that list is much larger. Right? Johnny, on the spot. All right. John, John I meant to ask yes. you earlier, did you sure. read the Friendly Local Game Store book before you opened your store? No. <laughs> okay. No, that was I, one thing I was really glad I did. Like, as soon as I started getting involved, I'm like, what materials are out there? And I found this book by Gary Ray called Friendly Local Game Store. I think it's like a five-year path to a middle-class income or something like that. Our problem like, okay, that. this sets some expectations. Our problem with it, and I know that we're trying to wrap this up, but our problem was is that the game store really was a secondary idea. Yeah. It was never really, that was never really the primary focus. And unfortunately... I think it read that way to people coming in also. Sure. I, and we didn't do it right. Uh, yeah. You know what I mean? Like I, when I talk about it closing up, it, I don't want that to sound like, oh, well, we did everything right and yeah. it just didn't work. No, that's not the case. Like it just became really hard to do, you know? Yeah. So. And at some point, if it's a side business, yeah. your other businesses take over very quickly. Yeah. Well, yeah. I mean, I was, I got talked into doing it. <laughs> you know what I mean? It, that is what it is, you know. But at the end, that partner quit. He quit three years ago. Wow. He just got mad. We got in a big fight. Uh, and it wasn't even about the game store, it was about everything in life. At 46 years old, he decided he wanted a kid, Fair got enough. his girlfriend pregnant. And, you know, and he's happy now. We're still friends. But yeah, like, then I had another, I've got another partner who's still currently my partner in the miniatures company, but you know, wow, it's life, man. That's why D and D groups fall apart and everything yeah. else. So. Absolutely. Absolutely. Life gets in the way sometimes. Yeah. Well, yeah, that's true. I want to say, I want to say in my group, uh, uh, would have did fall apart, but now I keep hearing, we need to open a gaming commune down there. Yeah. yeah I want to come live with you, Matt. Yeah. Yeah. That's always been the joke for years. I, I got to play, I got to play a game with you at some point, Matt. Like you're fairly legendary. Everybody, everybody speaks extremely highly of your, of your games. So my problem was Matt always ran games on the one day I had off. So it's like, do I do laundry and have food to eat or do I go play a game with a man? <laughs> this is a really hard call. Priorities. Yeah. <laughs> and then you got married and it became twice as difficult. 
Yeah, then there's other time commitments and it gets ramped up even more, yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. All right. Well, thank you guys for coming. Yeah, um, appreciate it. And uh, everybody listen to what the War Mistress has to say after the video because I always forget all the, all the, the magic words. But thank you all. <laughs> um, and as always, uh, happy gaming. Mm -hmm. If you like what we do here on the channel, don't forget to like, comment, subscribe, and hit the bell, because it really helps us out.